So a warm welcome to everyone. 20 people have joined so far, which is good to see. And as you all know, this is a special meeting, one of the annual commemorative meetings that the United Lodge of Theosophists holds. This is the one we call Judge Day or William Q. Judge Day. And it so happens that this year, the Sunday is the exact date of that anniversary, the anniversary of the day on which he passed away, which was the 21st of March, 125 years ago today, 1896. And so you all have either the link to the PDF or the PDF itself. Both of those are in the chat box to download. And the format that the meeting will take after these brief announcements is that there will be a first reading and the text of all the readings is in the handout so that you can read along yourself while listening to the reader. After the first reading, we'll have the first talk which will be around 15 minutes, a biographical talk about a particular important period in William Judge's life. And then we have the second reading. The first is from HPB, the second from William Judge himself. Then the second talk, which will be longer. And on the subject, which is the theme of this year's Judge Day meeting, William Q. Judge, and the real esoteric Raja Yoga. Then after that, we have the third reading from the writings of Robert Crosby. And then we'll have a question and answer panel. So an opportunity for you to ask any questions you have based on things you heard in the talks, or even things you didn't hear in the talks, but relating to this meeting you'll be able to ask them either by typing in the chat box or unmuting your microphone and the two speakers will take your questions. That will hopefully be able to last for 15 or 20 minutes or so if we run on time with everything and then a few brief words to sum up at the end. So we aim to finish at the usual Sunday time of 8.30 p.m. UK time. So next Sunday, we have a study group meeting with a compilation from the writings of H. P. Blavatsky titled Karma, Skandhas and the Lipika. The summary says, Theosophy mentions Lipikas as scribes, recorders and agents of karma, but what are they and how do they work? What is their relation to the four Maharajas also connected with karma? So some of that terminology, if you're not familiar to it, may sound confusing or even bewildering to begin with, but hopefully you'll find from that meeting that these terms, although they're from Sanskrit, relate to important universal principles and concepts that have a direct bearing on our own life and on the life of humanity. So that's next Sunday at seven. On Tuesday, we have the ongoing Kita Theosophy and Dhammapada study group. And on Wednesday, the ongoing study group in the Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, on human evolution. Tuesday and Wednesday meetings are from 7 to 8.15 p.m. The Sundays are from 7 to 8.30. So just before we go to the first reading, I'd like to read a few words written by Robert Crosby founder of the United Lodge of Theosophists, words that he published in the very first issue 
of the ULT's Theosophy magazine in November 1912 in an article about William Judge. He said, it may seem to some that this will be the laying of too great stress on a personality, a fault to which humanity is prone and in regard to which not a few have learned to be fearful. But it is hoped that it may be shown that while the person is indicated, the real object is to point to a source in which personalities play a necessary part as messengers to the world of men. Having determined the real messengers, we are then in the position to obtain the message of theosophy, pure and simple, and can begin its study on a sure basis. The basic inquiry, therefore, would lie in the triple question, what is theosophy? Whence came it? Who brought it? Find the right persons, and you have the presentation of theosophy, pure and simple. Then and then only is one in the position to know whether any claim or statement affirmed to be theosophical is so or not. When H.P. Blavatsky left America, the land of her adoption by naturalization and the birthplace of the Theosophical Society, she left her colleague William Q. Judge to carry on the work in that country, which she declared was the cradle of the new race and held the crest wave of advancing civilization. It must be apparent that for such a task there would be selected the one best fitted to lay down the lines needed for the great end in view. Error cannot be charged in a matter of such great importance without practically denying the existence of masters, their knowledge and theosophy itself, for they all stand or fall together. H. P. Blavatsky and William Q. Judge, in their capacity of messengers, cannot be separated. They stand or fall together. Those who are found belittling one will be found belittling the other. Their writings are mutually corroborative and complementary. Studied together, they embody the noblest religious ideal, the highest all-inclusive philosophy the most practical application, giving the science of life, the art of living, the very knowledge that humanity stands in crying need of. And we've received WQJ Day greetings from the Mumbai ULT in India. They send their greetings saying in part let us reflect the freshness and the joy of nature referring to the spring equinox in our consciousness by silencing the inner chatter and fixing our whole attention on the masters and by doing our best in their names with immense devotion without a shadow of doubt or despair. The Bombay Lodge will observe the occasion by holding a special meeting with a talk on the Mahatmas and the path to them. There was another message from the Ahmad Ahmedabad ULT study group in Ahmedabad, India, which is longer than we have time to read out in full, but I'll copy and paste it into the chat box. And 
Yes, I'll copy and paste that rather than reading it. And greetings were also received from some Brazilian associates of the ULT in Brazil talking about a meeting they would be having today commemorating William Judge in the Portuguese language. And one Brazilian associate wrote, invisible threads unite all those who contribute with heart and mind to the movement. Let the threads be lit today by the light of the elder brothers and sisters so that we can sense them and reinvigorate our votes in favour of this, our humanity, and of the beings that will become one in the future. So with that in mind, we'll now go to the first talk from the writings of H.P. Blavatsky. Thank you. This is the first reading from H.G. E. Labatska. It is easy to become a theosophist, any person of average intellectual capacities, and are leaning toward the metaphysical of pure, unselfish life, who finds more joy in helping his neighbor than in receiving help himself. One who is ever ready to sacrifice his own pleasures for the sake of other people and who loves truth, goodness, and wisdom for their own sake, not for the benefit they may confer, is a theosophist. But it is quite another matter to put oneself upon the path which leads to the knowledge of what is good to do as to the right discrimination of good from evil, a path which also leads a man to that power through which he can do the good he desires, often without even apparently lifting a finger. It is the motive, the motive alone, which makes any exercise of power become black, malignant, or white, beneficent magic. It is impossible to employ spiritual forces when there is the slightest thing of selfishness remaining in the operator. For unless the intention is entirely unalone, the spiritual will transform itself into the psychic, act on the astral plane, and dire results may be produced by it. The powers and forces of animal nature can equally be used by the selfish and revengeful, and by the unselfish and the all-forgiving. The powers and forces of spirit lend themselves only to the perfectly pure in heart. This is divine magic. What are then the conditions required to become a student of the divinity of Pienzi? No man can swim unless he enters deep water. No bird can fly unless its wings are grown, and it has space before it and the courage to trust itself to the air. A man who will wield a two-edged sword must be a twelve master of the blunt weapon, if he will not injure himself or what is worse, others at the first attempt. The key in each degree is the aspirant himself, it is not the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom, but the knowledge of self, which is wisdom itself. How grand and true appear thus to the student of occultism, who has commenced to realize some of the foregoing truth. The answer given by the Delphic Oracle to all who came seeking after occult wisdom, words repeated and enforced again and again by the wise Socrates. Man, know thyself. Excerpts from the article Practical Occultism, published in H. P. Blavatska, Theosophical Articles, Volume 2, HPV Pamphlet Number 9, Spiritual Evolution, and Raja Yoga, or Occultism. And now we shall proceed 
with the first talk. So we're going to look briefly at Judge's life and work, principally between 1884 and 1889. It was an interesting time for him. Um, it was really the beginning of, of his really um, new direction that he went in. Uh, he had a new impetus after he visited India. And that's really what we want to just say a little bit about in, in a quarter of an hour. And just give you some feeling about the man himself. Um, the reading that we just had from HPV is very relevant to remembering Judge because his whole life seemed to be uh, symbolic of, of that mastery and ability which uh, the, the real practice of Raja Yoga gives its, um, its students. And um, we'll, as we go through tonight, we'll, we'll just explore some of those ideas. So before we get to 1884, which is when he left New York for quite a long visit to Europe and India, let's just see what he wrote about what life was actually like in, from 1875 onwards when he first met um, HPV and then roughly uh, three years later uh, when she left um, America, HPV left with Colonel Olcott having spent three years in New York uh, never to return. Um, she, went, she went to India to start the, the movement there. And he writes um, in some very interesting literature called Conversations on Occultism with HPV. It's in his two volumes. That in 1875, 76, 77, and, and 78, my intimacy with HPV gave me many opportunities for conversing with her on what we then called magic. These useful and for me very wonderful occasions came about late at night and sometimes during the day. I was then in the habit of calling on her in the daytime whenever I could get away from my office. He was a, um, a lawyer. Many times I stayed in her flat for the purpose of hearing as much and seeing as much as I could. Later on in 1884, I spent many weeks with HPB in uh, Paris, the Rue Notre Dame de Chant Champ, sitting beside her day after day and evening after evening, and later still in 1888, being with her in London at Holland Park, which is just round the corner from the lodge here. I had a few more opportunities. Now, these, this period in New York was um, a tremendously busy, active period for, for well, for everyone in, in the movement. I mean, there were lots of people attracted to it. It was making the newspapers. Um, there were... Uh, Initially, there was a lot of interest in spiritualism, which um, HPB had uh, also investigated, and that's how she met Colonel Olcott and and uh, and Judge. But they were all brought together in in New York as part of this plan that the Masters had been working on for for many many decades. It was part of the end of century effort, the last twenty five years of every century. They make that effort. Um, but by the time HPB left in 1878, he, he, he was then left alone up until 1884 with very little direct contact with HPB or the, or the masters. Um, 
this great excitement had, had gone and he felt quite abandoned. Finally, in 1883, he'd been in correspondence with Damodar Malenka, her, or I think um, Malavanka should be. He was a well-known Indian theosophist at Adyar. He was also um, a cello. And on the back of this <clears throat> letter was written a message from, from Judge's master, just telling him he 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 better come. And that's something he'd been waiting for. Um, so he made preparations and in early 1884 he went to India <clears throat> via Europe, where HPB was with Colonel Orcott. Um, they'd both left Adia uh, after the Coulomb affair. We'll say just a little bit about that later. So he took a ship across. Uh, he spent a bit of time in London, not very long, a few weeks, I think. And then he went on to Paris and he arrived at the end of March, um, uh, where HPB was working on the secret doctrine and Colonel Alcott was with her. And he wrote that um, on a, after a conversation with HPB, that the master had told HPB in India that he was going to do or about to do something with and for judge. And that seems important. That's a bit of a clue. He, he's, he said very little about his trip to India, um, apart from the, the investigating the Coulomb uh, affair. But that's that's one of these, these clues. He'd, he'd given, and that he'd also been ordered by the masters to stop in with uh, HPV in, in Paris. And um, she was in uh, Belgium as well during the writing of the Secret Doctrine. When he arrived in London, he seemed to be quite adversely affected by the atmosphere there. He was seemed to have got much more susceptible and more sensitive. And this was possibly connected with um, his visit to India. And when he arrived in the continent, HPB gave him a ring, which was like a magnetic token from her. And, and that apparently helped judge. She said that HPB had invited uh, him to work on the SD with her. And he wrote that he was sitting in the same room with her reading Isis Unveiled, making notes at the bottom of each page. Now, Isis Unveiled was published in 1877, so that would have been seven years before. And in fact, he'd helped, he and Alcott had helped HPB write Isis Unveiled when they were together in New York. So he knew it quite well by all accounts. Anyway, she'd asked him to, to help go through it and um, she was going to use that because uh, Isis Unveiled was originally going to be, uh, sorry, the Secret Doctrine was originally going to be a rewrite of Isis. But it turned into something much more. Incidentally, when, when they were writing it, um, they'd raised some subscriptions and to, to, to pay for the cost of um, printing and, and producing it, typesetting it, which in those days was expensive. And by the time it eventually, the Secret Auction came out in 1888, it was many, many years over, overdue. It was such a, such a difficult book to write. Because this is them writing it in um, early 1884. Now, this is just a bit of a, a map showing you. So he arrived in London in February 84. I don't know whether you can see that very clearly. The slides will be on the internet later if you want to look. Um, he then went on to Paris and arrived there at the end of March. He stayed there until the middle of June. So he was quite a long time with HPB and, and Alcott. And then he left. Uh, Europe. He sailed, I think it must have been around the Horn in those days, and arrived in 
Bombay about a month later. And then a month after that, he was in Adyar, which is the other side of India. The image at the bottom is um, typical Atlantic Ocean liner that he would have, something like that, he would have taken to go from New York to uh, London. Now we'll say a little bit more about Judge's time in Adyar because that's when things were interesting. He was up there for about 10 weeks, but there was a four week period when no one seems to have known or certainly written down in any of the records where he was. Um, as I said, uh, HBB and Olcott had left some time before that. The Coulomb scandal was named after Emma and uh, Alexis, I think her husband was called Coulomb, who were the housekeepers of HBB. She, people she'd met in um, Egypt, I think it was probably in 1873, so ten, at least 10 years before that. Um, they had essentially betrayed HPB. They made up um, stories about the masters fabricating letters and that there weren't any masters and that there weren't any letters. And that um, they'd been paid by the Christian missionaries to to say this. Um, and this burst all over the, the, the press in India and, and there was a lot of fallout. And uh, HPB left India not exactly under a cloud, but um, it, it was a very difficult time for her and it was grossly unjust what was being claimed by the Kunals. Now, when Judge turned up in Adyar in the um, middle of August, he then met Master Moria, who was his master. And th this, this missing four-week period, which uh, we don't know anything about, One thing that we should, we don't have time to go into it, but we should say that Judge was known as the Raja by his friends. He had taken over, he was actually an Indian a nobleman, he'd taken over the body of an Irish boy who died quite young. And he'd been helped to inhabit the body. It's called um, Tulku. Is, is one, um, it's, it's quite well known that adepts do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a magical process. So Judge wasn't really what he seemed. Um, and then there's, there's a well-known book called The Judge Case uh, by um, a Canadian, Ernest uh, Pelletier, published, well, getting on for 20 years ago now. Pelletier suggests that he completed an initiation during that missing month. He may not have had time to go up to Tibet, uh, which is normally what would have happened, but um, he, he needn't necessarily have been there. And something to support this was some, uh, a letter that HPV wrote to him a couple of years after 1886 saying that he had not realized the change that had taken place in him a few years before when a near manakaya had blended with his astral nature. And then that's quite a mysterious statement, but I think it says a lot if, if you understand what a near manakaya is and, and how they work and, and also judges um, sort of double life as, as uh, an Indian adept, essentially. Uh, what happened when he returned to the USA? Well, if we find him writing 
an um, increasing number of articles. During the nine years before he left, he'd only written four that are in his um, well-known group of articles. From a, from a couple of years after that, he began to average um, 20, 30, even one a week um, during that time. He started a path mag the Path magazine, which HPB thought was one of the best theosophical magazines in print. He seems to have had a transformed life and character and powers of expression. Um, he, as a person, he became very inspirational. He was a very warm figure. His wisdom and kindness um, enabled and in, invigorated others really to help him in, in the work of building up the TS in America. And they, they built it up to over a hundred lodges in 10 years. I mean, if you think about that, that's almost one, one lodge starting every month. So you can imagine that the work would have been absolutely tremendous, the, the administration of, of actually doing that. He was very well loved by those who, who worked closely with him. He was very popular. He was a great organizer. He was elected vice president of the TS in 1888 and, and a unanimous vote um, saw him made president of the American and European sections uh, four years after that. In terms of the effect of going to India, you can see um, a friend sent the um, judges' articles and they happened to have dates on them, so it wasn't very hard to sort them and count them. And you can see the, the effect on the returning from India age 33, this tremendous output of work. From 1887 onwards, he began to write um, some, some very well-researched and scholarly books. The epitome, the potential is aphorisms he translated, the Gita and the notes on the Gita, echoes from the Orient. Um, the Ocean of Theosophy was written in one week, and it, it's a, still being read widely today. It's a wonderful book. It's, it's like a summary of the secret doctrine. Forum Answers was um, a lot of the, his published answers in magazines and his correspondence and letters that help me. Another superb collection of letters. I mean, if you want to get a good idea about Judge, you should read those letters. So we'll just finish by giving you a um, picture later on. This is New York and the Theosophical, but you can just see at the top of the page, the Theosophical Society on 144 Madison Avenue. Judges down there in the middle at the front. If you enlarge that a little bit, uh, you can see him there <laughs> resting his elbow on his uh, neighbor's knee. And uh, there's Crosby. We think that looks like Crosby on the far left who's a young man. That was the um, convention. So that's all we wanted to say in this talk. We'll now have the second, uh, well, after the second reading, we'll have a talk on the real esoteric Raja Yoga, which Judge, judge taught. So we'll have the second reading now. And then after that um, talk, by the way, there'll be a Q&A panel where you can ask questions. This is the second reading from uh, William Judge. What then is the panacea, finally, the royal talisman? It is duty, selflessness, Duty persistently followed is the highest yoga and is better than mantrams or any posture or any other thing. If you can do no more than duty, it will bring you to the goal. 
And, my dear friends, I can swear it. The Masters are watching us all. And without fail, when we come to the right point and really deserve, they manifest to us. At all times, I know they help and try to aid us as far as we will let them. Anyway, you are right that struggling is wrong. Do it quietly. That is the way the masters do it. The reaction the other way is just as you say. But the master has so much wisdom, he is seldom if ever, the prey of reactions. That is why he goes slowly. But it is sure. I know how the clouds come and go. That is all right. Just wait, as the song says, till they roll by. Arouse, arouse in you the meaning of Thou art that, thou art the self. This is the thing to think of in meditation. And if you believe it, then tell others the same. You have read it before, but now try to realize it more and more each day, and you will have the light you want. If you will look for wisdom, you will get it, sure. And that is all you want or need. I'm glad all looks well. It will always look well if each and all minded their own things and kept the mind free from all else. Will and desire lie at the doors of meditation and concentration. If we desire truth with the same intensity that we had formerly wished for success, money or gratification, we will speedily acquire meditation and possess concentration. If we do all our acts, small and great, every moment, for the sake of the whole human race, as representing the Supreme Self, then every cell and fiber of the body and inner man will be turned in one direction, resulting in perfect concentration. This is expressed in the New Testament in the statement that if the eye is single, the whole body will be full of light. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it is still more clearly and comprehensively given through the different chapters. In one, it is beautifully put as the lighting up in us of the Supreme One, who then becomes visible. Let us meditate on that which is in us as the highest self, concentrate upon it, and will to work for it as dwelling in every human heart. This has been taken from letters that have helped me and the article Meditation, Concentration and Will. And now we will have our second talk. Thank you so much, Ted. The topic of the second talk is uh, the real esoteric Raja Yoga, which, as uh, Matiana mentioned before at the beginning, is the theme for this year. And I will mainly focus around three areas. I will try to explain what Raja Yoga is, then briefly go over the eight limbs of Raja Yoga according to the Patanjali system. And finally, I will talk about the Raja Yoga of Theosophy 
that William Q. Judge dedicated his life to and um, was teaching. So what is Raja Yoga? According to the Theosophical Dictionary, it is the true system developing psychic and spiritual powers and union with one's higher self, Ishvara, a portion of the, of the eternal supreme spirit enshrined in each human body. It is the exercise, regulation and concentration of thoughts. The term Raja Yoga means royal yoga. Although you might have come across other names such as kingly yoga or queenly yoga. However, Raja Yoga in its more most direct translation would, uh, would be royal yoga. And it consists in the restriction of the worlds of the mind since an adherent of, Raj of Raja Yoga or a practitioner of Raja Yoga sees the diverse psychomental states as a source of never-ending suffering and bondage. Therefore, the control of the psychic flux or this continuously changing mental state is a preliminary condition for the final emancipation, that is, the realization of the self. Raja Yoga, in its general usage in the world, is a synonym for Patanjali's system. Mind you, Patanjali himself didn't call it Raja Yoga, um, as far as we know, he simply called it Yoga, meaning union through concentration or sometimes simply concentration. This is how Patanjali explains the essence of Raja Yoga in Yoga Aphorisms in Book 1, according to William Q. Judge's rendition of the work. The hindering of the, of the modifications of the mind already referred to is to be effected by means of exercise and dispassion. Exercise is the uninterrupted or repeated effort that the mind shall remain in its unmoved state. This exercise is a firm position observed out of regard for the end in view and perse perseveringly adhered to for a long time without intermission. This passion is the having overcome one's desires. And naturally, those four verses are followed by W.Q. Judge's commentary. This is to say that in order to acquire concentration, we must again and again make efforts to obtain such control over the mind that we can at any time when it seems necessary, so reduce it to an unmoved condition or apply it to any one time, uh, sorry, to any one point to the exclusion of all others. The student must not conclude from this that he can never acquire concentration unless he devotes every moment of his life to it, for the words without intermission apply but to the length of time that has been set apart from the practice. And finally, this passion is the attainment of a state of being in which the consciousness is unaffected by passion, desires and ambitions, which aid in causing modifications of the mind. Hence, after every thought, every emotion, or any other internal act has been pacified and, and fully subdued, the transcendent self, Purusha man, can finally abide in its um, unrestricted splendor, so to say. One often identifies himself with the finite and limiting mind, creating a specific human personality. We know it as the heresy of separateness or but this is simply self-delusion, and this self-delusion is called 
new science or avidya in Sanskrit, which is unfortunately the nourishing ground on which thrive egoism, attachment, aversion, and thirst for life, and therefore is to be avoided. Well, in our case, is to be avoided, surely in the case of adepts, is to be destroyed. The revelation of the self to itself happens only in the deepest absorption, when the phenomenal consciousness is completely withdrawn from the body, from the body-mind complex, and, uh, and is transformed into the witness consciousness, as the supreme essence of man. This illumination or realization is truly indescribable. Though it is possible to communicate some of its distinct features mainly with the aid of paradoxes. Now, what is a paradox? Um, it is a logically self-contradictory statement, which, which leads to seemingly self-contradictory or, or a logically unacceptable conclusion. And yet, with the use of paradoxes, we could perhaps get a little bit closer to understanding this state of mind. Some of you might be familiar with this graph here, since I used the same one in um, about two weeks ago when I spoke about um, Hatha Yoga, um, or about eight limbs rather. Raja Yoga consists of eight spheres of application, which are called the eight limbs. Ashtanga. And as we can see, these are starting from yamas. Yamas, forbearance or external discipline, niyama, religious or spiritual observances, internal discipline, asana or asanas, postures, pranayama, suppression of the breath, um, pratyahara, restraint, dharana, attention, dhyana, contemplation, and finally samadhi, meditation, or the union of the divine. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, as I did it uh, two weeks ago, but very, very shortly for those who might have missed um, this, this seminar. Um, Yama deals with one's ethical standards and sense of integrity, focusing on our behavior and how we conduct ourselves in life. So this is very much uh, related to our social position. This um, yamas can be divided into five, um, five yamas. So we talk about ahimsa, non-violence, satya, truthfulness or veracity, as William Q. Judge would refer to it, astya, which is non-stealing, brahmacharya, continence or sometimes moderation, aparigraha, non-covetness or non-hoarding, um, non-attachment to material possessions. Niyamas, on the other hand, as we said, mm, has to do with self-discipline and spiritual observances. So slowly we are moving from the external to the internal aspects. And gradually you will see the same pattern um, going deeper and deeper and deeper into well, within us. The five niyamas are sauha, purification of soul and body, samtosa, contentment, tapas, self-discipline or spiritual austerities, svadhyaya, study of the sacred scriptures, ishvara pranidana, surrender or persevere, persevering devotion to the supreme soul. Next, we've got asanas, the postures practiced in yoga. In the yogic view, the body is a temple of spirit. And through the practice of asanas, we develop the habit of discipline and the ability to concentrate, both of which discipline and concentration um, or attention are necessary for meditation. And then pranayama, generally translated as breath control, um, as implied by the literal translation of pranayama, it means life force extension. Um, right, um, I would say 
these first four stages of Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga concentrate on refining our personalities and, and gaining mastery over the body and developing an energetic awareness of ourselves, all of which prepares us for the second half of this journey, which deals with the senses, the mind, and attaining a higher state of consciousness. Hence, Pratyahara means withdrawal or sensory transcendence. It is during this stage that we make the conscious effort to draw our awareness away from the external world and from the outside stimuli. Dharana, Dharana, the practice, so as you can see, one leads to another. So the practice of Pratyahara creates the setting for Dharana or attention. Having relieved ourselves of outside distractions, we can now deal with the distractions of the mind itself. In Pratyahara, previously, we, became, uh, we become self-observant and now in Dharana we focus our attention on a single point, on one pointedness. Now, extended periods of attention naturally lead to um, meditation or contemplation. Here we've got Dhyana, named contemplation, where Dharana practices one pointed attention. Dhyana ultimately is ultimately a state of being keenly aware without focus or simply maintaining the state of attention, this one pointedness, effortlessly, effortlessly. At this stage, the mind has been quieted and is in the stillness. It, produ it produces few or no thoughts at all. Yes. Samadhi, finally, uh, Patanjali describes this as a state of ecstasy. At this stage, the meditator merges with his or her point of focus and transcends the self altogether. The meditator comes to realize a profound connection to the, the, to the divine and interconnectedness with all living things. Finally, as I promised, um, I'm going to talk about the Raja Yoga of Theosophy. And in this part, you might hear a few practical advice on meditation. I've noticed that um, in our previous talk, we heard about Damodar Mavalankar. And indeed, I'm going to mention him here as well. In his article contemplation, he stresses that Raja Yoga requires no physical postures, therefore asanas that we mentioned before, but instead asks to adopt certain and particular mental positions. Esoteric philosophy deals with the inner world of noumena, not the outer shell of phenomena. The first requisite for it is through purity of heart. Then the reasoning from the known to the unknown. And meditation must be practiced. The known, which is the phenomenal world. It is cognizable by our five senses. And all that we see in this manifested world um, are the effects, the causes, which are to be sought after in the noumenal, the unmanifested or the unknown world. And this is to be accomplished by meditation, that is continued attention to the subject, as we said before. William Pugh Judge, in Letters That Have Helped Me, reminds us that while meditating, it's quite important, the picture you see are to be observed with indifference relying always on the higher self and not looking for it uh, and not and sorry and looking to it for knowledge and light whether we see some mental images or not it doesn't really matter in his article shall we teach clairvoyance he warns us against attempting at clairvoyance as it leads into interior and exterior passive state where he, where the will is gradually overpowered, leaving a practitioner at the mercy of demons 
who lurk around the threshold of our consciousness. So once again, I just would like to stress that all those images, um, flashes, lights that might be, we might be observing, especially at the beginning, as, as the mm, beginners in meditation, are not to be taken that seriously. This is all psychic. One may ask, is Raja Yoga the best way as a practical path of inner development? Well, we, we, we believe so. Having said that, we add that the Raja Yoga of Theosophy is not quite the same as Patanjali's Raja Yoga. But it is more than that. And actually, it precedes Patanjali. In the book, The Voice of the Silence, the Voice of the Silence, which HBB translated from the mm, Book of the Golden Precepts, we get some glimpses of the Raja Yoga system, of the Trans-Himalayan Brotherhood or Lodge or Esoteric School. That brotherhood, which is most closely and directly linked to our Theosophical movement. And we read in the Voice of the Silence, every stage of development in Raja Yoga is symbolized by a geometrical figure. And it also includes the all important bodhisattva path and the practice of the paramitas or golden virtues, not in a merely moralistic sense, but as definite portals and gateways of initiation, initiation that leads to becoming a bodhisattva or nir nirmanakaya, an adept who who reaches to but renounces the eternal bliss of nirvana. So refuses the total reabsorption in the infinite in order to stay with humanity, to remain on earth or in the psychic atmosphere of earth, in order to help teach and guide suffering humanity out of boundless compassion for as long as life continues. Therefore, it is highly recommended to study Patanjali alongside the voice of the silence in order to get a full picture, a broader and much more fruitful and rewarding realization of the Raja Yoga system of those who theosophists call the masters. We further learn from the article Culture of Concentration Part 2 by William Q. Judge that a complete knowledge of all that was ever written upon concentration will confer no power in the practice. He then clarifies that book knowledge is not to be avoided, but that sort of acquisition without the concentration is completely useless. Because the true practice is called Raja Yoga. It directs the student to virtue and altruism as the basis from which to start. He says, let the seeker know once and for all that the virtues cannot be discarded or ignored. They must be made a part of our life and their philosophical basis must be understood. But it may be asked as well, if in the culture of concentration, we will succeed alone by the practice of virtue, because we must be realistic at, at this stage. The answer is no. Not in this life, but perhaps one day in a later life. The life of virtue accumulates much merit, and that merit will at some time cause one to be born in a wise family where the real practice of concentration may begin, or, in, or it may cause uh, one to be born in a family of devotees or those far advanced on the path, as, is, as it is said in uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Also, William Judge um, stresses that the lazy ones and they who ask for pleasure may as well give it up at the threshold. Since immense fields of investigation and experiment have to be traversed, dangerous and thought of and forces unknown are to be met. And all must be overcome. For in this battle, there is no quarter asked or given. Great stores of knowledge may be found and seized. 
And here comes the almost one of the very famous phrases by William Q. Judge that the kingdom of heaven is not to be had, not to be had for the asking. It must be taken by violence. And the only way in which we can gain the will and the power to thus seize and hold is by acquiring the virtues on the one hand and minutely understanding ourselves on the other. Someday we will begin to see why not one passing thought may be ignored, not one flitting impression missed. And I think it's very, very important. And to finish off, our 24-7 life is our most important meditation. Each day, endeavour to live consciously, harmlessly and at the highest point of consciousness possible. Continually make an effort, regardless of what you may be doing, to keep the consciousness elevated and the mind concentrated. Remember the self in all things and all things in the self. Do what you can to help and serve others in the spirit of divine compassion. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Anya. So we have the third reading coming up now. This is the third reading by Robert Crosby. Each one of us stands in the mist of a great and silent evolution. The beans below us in forms of the mineral, vegetable and animal world are all working just as we are working toward a greater and greater realization of the whole. Sparks of the one spirit, of the one consciousness. They have begun their little lives and forms, our bodies by which they may contact others. As they have need for better and better instruments, need for further and further contact, they evolve from within a better instrument. Such is the whole course of evolution, always from within outwards, and always with the tendency to an increasing individuality. From the one ocean of life, there finally tends to arise divinity. Divinity is always acquired. It is not an endowment. It does not exist of itself. If we could be made good, if we could be made to turn around and take a righteous course, life might seem very much easier to us. But there there is no escaping the law. No one can get us off from the effects of our wrongdoing. No one can confer knowledge on another. Each one has to see and know for himself. Each one has to gain divinity of himself and in his own way. We think of this as a common world, but it is not so. There are no two people who look at life from the same viewpoint, who have the same likes and dislikes, whom the same things affect in exactly the same way. No two people are alike either in life or after the death of the body. Each makes his own state. Each makes his own limitations. Each acquires his own divinity. Divinity lies latent in each one of us. All powers lie latent in everyone, and no being anywhere can be greater than we may become. What is divinity but an all-inclusive knowledge? True spirituality is not a hazy condition. It is not something that denies any portion of the universe, nor any kind of being. A hazy, abstract condition would mean no men, no principles, no opposites. But divine spirituality is the power to know and see whatever is wished to be known or seen. It is an intimate knowledge of the ultimate essence of everything in nature. 
All-inclusive knowledge lies before every living being, if he will but take the necessary steps. What prevents him are the false ideas he holds, for thought is the basis of all action, and wrong ideas in regard to life inevitably bring about wrong actions. We have thought we are all different because we have different ideas, but in essence we are one. The one life in each of us, the one life is in each of us. Each one of us stands in the same position looking out, all the rest are seen. Starting from this point, we begin to find ourselves, to see ourselves, to feel ourselves, and in feeling ourselves, feel all others. All that a man can know of God is what he knows in himself, through himself and by himself. All the great saviors of all times have asked him to take the step that the height of his calling demands, to know himself, to know his own true nature, and the nature of every other being. They have shown that the real man must assert himself and must act in accordance with his own nature. And the responsibility which the oneness of all nature demands. These are excerpts from the article The Kingly Mystery, published in The Friendly Philosopher and Universal Theosophy. Now we'll have a Q&A panel with Will and Matiana. Thank you, Zara. Yes, so uh, we have just over 15 minutes now to take any questions and comments anyone may have about the talks or if you have any about the readings or anything about or related to William Judge. So feel free to type those in the chat box or to unmute and speak them out. I see someone is typing. Two people are typing. Does no one else have a question at this point? Oh, oh, I have also a question. Yes. Um, is there a difference between um, practicing yoga alone or is there more power when we're in a group together? That's a good question. Well, I'll put that to the two speakers. The question was, is there more power in practicing yoga in a group or is it best done individually? Doing yoga in a group or doing yoga individually? Is that yes. correct? Yes. Well, I mean, we are all invited, but I can take this question. That's okay. Um, well, yoga means the union, so I suppose that that would be most efficient if people collectively worked on the same union and harmony in the world because that would bring the fastest uh, results and I remember only a few weeks ago it was said that actually as a humanity we are a little bit we are falling a little bit behind where we should be if I can uh, say so in our development, in our spiritual development, because we are so trapped in the material world. So I would say um, probably group or collective yoga is what we are looking for. Because on an individual, on the individual level, we would, yes, we would develop possibly even very, quite fast. But the real challenge comes from um, coexistence from the fact that we work with other people and we need to adapt, we need to learn from different situations and we need to harmonize 
our relationships with with people and then bring the collective to some mutual conclusions i think this is the hardest bit isn't it but yeah. please take part and i think to answer that question we yes. need to remember what we mean philosophically by yoga and that is predominantly this raja yoga that was the subject of the second talk which is not physical yoga that you could do in a yoga center or a yoga group it's internal self-induced internal transformation and elevation of the consciousness which can ultimately only be done by each individual within themselves but it's certainly true that the more people make that effort the more it benefits the world but my understanding is we don't necessarily need to be all in the same room doing that together to make it more effective and yes, yes. Ro robert crosby for example wrote that some people both of his time and also today some people were saying that places where you can do group meditation are more appealing than going to a theosophy meeting where you listen and talk and he said that group meditation sessions may often give people a nice feeling but it may not necessarily be of a spiritual kind it may be more of an emotional psychic feeling that comes from the fact of knowing that there's other people there focusing on the same things you're focusing on on inner levels but the real progress has to be made within each person but maybe someone else had a comment on that uh could i uh, make a comment yeah isn't it true that um both individual and group work are complementary that yeah. um, um, re really what uh, you need both particularly at the early stages uh, of, of walking on the path I mean a spiritual path because it said I think by William Judge that the uh, belonging to a group <clears throat> helps provide motivation to progress to practice um, because uh, unless you you have very strong discipline self-discipline uh, it can be difficult particularly uh, if you're a beginner <clears throat> to to regularly practice med daily meditation on your own um, and also with a group like theosophy you, you also get <clears throat> the um, uh, let's see all the, the theoretical the the um, uh, metaphysical knowledge and a background uh, that um, uh, it reinforces, you know, the let's see the the need, the need or the the purpose of meditation. You see, to to uh, well, firstly to gain self knowledge, um, to know oneself, but also to perfect one's lower nature and transform it, so that. Um, one is able to receive higher wisdom <clears throat> um, and, and and higher knowledge and become let's say a truer human being in every way I mean I don't think not most of uh, us uh, are not go starting with the 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 goal of becoming adepts as such you know this is a this process of many lifetimes maybe hundreds uh, you, you know, before that stage is reached, and, and we have to start from where we are, and um, uh, stage by stage or st step by step. And I think <clears throat> um, the the two are complementary: uh, the individual work and the and the group work, or the Thank you. because tra traditionally, you know. Um, all disciples and chalers were were in groups with a, with a master at their head, 
Uh, so Thank that you. was the traditional way of, of of following a spiritual path, rather than um, being a loner, so to speak. Thank you, David. And when I ask, what is group work of Raja Yoga? And we should remember HPV's definition of Raja Yoga, which was quoted in the second talk, that it is the exercise of thought, the regulation of thought, and the concentration of thought, which is partly done in meditation, but as Anya summarized at the end, it's also what we're meant to be doing 24 hours a day in all that we do. And so even attending a ULT meeting is a practice in Raja Yoga if we're keeping the mind exercised and concentrated and regulated while we do it. And but everything also, even washing the dishes, writing an email, waking up, going to sleep, all become what Dhammada called the 24-7 practice of Raja Yoga. So there's a few hands up, but just before we take those, there's some relevant comments from Will in the chat box. He said, if in Raja Yoga, the goal is to unite with our higher self, then it is an internal thing. So it would be a turning inwards and upwards, which has to be done on our own, according to the theosophical view. And then he wrote, isn't there also some warning given in the teachings about group meditation? If it is not done under certain conditions of purity, so maybe at a certain stage, as there is a risk of psycho-astral contamination. But we do sometimes mention that group meditation seems inadvisable in light of things said in Theosophy. I don't know of any particular quote in Theosophy that says specifically group meditation is not advisable. But we do know that it isn't actively advised in Theosophy. And Joan commented, I feel that whilst group work is motivating and can be supportive, the real work has to be carried forward individually in the real world. So now we'll take the two hands up. I think Vijaya was first. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say uh, this uh, support this view that has already been exp expressed. Uh, we have in the ULT study classes, generally speaking, uh, the the uh, the study of knowledge that uh, David mentioned, and uh, by question and answer, we try to deepen the ideas and uh, uh, and get more knowledge uh, that's the thing type of thing that we do in the study classes and that's very good uh, for acquiring knowledge and the second thing is theosophy recommends by the the books like voice of the silence patanjali yoga aphorisms and also the bhagavad gita and also the light on the path all these books uh, invite us to go through an exercise, a mental exercise of mental discipline, of concentration and contemplation and uh, towards meditation as an individual um, exos mental exercise, which has to be done in parallel. And like it was said, this will take lives at lives, many, many lives to come. And it's important if we follow the Raja Yoga, the system, the Patanjali's aphorisms. Uh, book one was mentioned in the talk, and then you have book two, which goes further. Actually, at the end of book two, we reach the stage of perfect concentration of mind. And uh, towards the end of book two only, we the, 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 the knowledge of um, breathing is is just mentioned or rather rather hinted uh, 
uh, because it goes with the concentration of mind and under the direction of mind, you have some uh, um, direction to be given particular uh, attention for breathing. But it's just mentioned. And after that, you have the third book, which mentions, uh, gives a whole list of uh, exercises by concentration, by that means perfect concentration of the mind on a certain subject, uh, one acquires a certain power. So as a result, we get go through a whole um, list of uh, exercises of concentration and acquiring powers. And in the last book, the fourth book, uh, it is uh, said that it's it's all about isolation that means there is isolation from the point of view of the physical outer universe of senses but there is an extreme depth in the in the looking for unity or union of one's um, human consciousness with the spiritual higher consciousness which we all have the the supreme spirit in us so so the whole process uh, shows the connection of union with the highest at the same time isolation from the point of view of the uh, phenomenon world or the world of senses and at the same time concentration um, on uh, of the mind on uh, specific spiritual powers thank you vijaya yes and if anyone who's joining today has never read Patanjali's yoga aphorisms then we'd recommend that you do and obviously we'd particularly recommend the william judge rendition which you can find as a free pdf on the lodge website as um, Although it's not a literal translation, it does give more of the esoteric Raja Yoga approach, whereas a lot of the literal translations are accompanied by uh, exoteric Hindu commentary, which sometimes gives very unhelpful or even detrimental advice. So Vikash has lowered his hand. Um, did you want to say anything, Vikash? Yes, actually, um, I had a different uh, topic. Um, uh, there was in the beginning of the meeting description about Tulku, uh, and it was referred to WQJ being a Tulku. Now, uh, I, I need some clarification here. Uh, so, as per my understanding, Tulku is a Tibetan word which means transference. Now. Dalai Lama and Tashi Lama both are supposed to be Tulkus because uh, they have numerous conscious incarnations wherein uh, Dalai Lama being the 14th incarnation wherein they are consciously taking rebirth into a new body and before even leaving the previous body they are able to give to their close disciples the description of the would-be new child or body in which they will uh, take rebirth. So this this process is, or a person or, or a high evolved person who can perform this is known as a tulku. Now uh, there is when it comes to WQJ, based on my understanding, WQJ who was in an Indian body and known as a raja. Uh, uh, he was a very wise adept wherein he consciously borrowed the body of the Irish child rather than got into a new new body, like a new birth and a new body. He entered into an existing body of an existing child. Uh, that is not uh, actually Tulku uh, based on my understanding. Uh, in, in Sanskrit it is known as Pravesha, it means to enter. Uh, but then it is a very high occult process wherein there is a contract between the existing uh, ego and the ego who is entering and uh, uh, things of those sort. 
But HPB's name is also associated with Tulku because it is asserted that she represented phases closely similar to Tulku or that she demonstrated the qualifications of performing Tulku or again that at times she exhibited the functioning of Tulku, all of which comes to the same thing as declaring that she represented a Tulku. But my point is that WQJ was not a Tulku. Uh, I, I need clarification on this. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll give us that to Will, who did the first. Yes, thanks, um, Vikash. I think the the process as HPB explained it in one of her reincarnation of, of Buddha articles. Um, it's one of the posthumous ones. I find a reference in there to it. It says uh, Tulpa, T-U-L-P-A, is the voluntary incarnation of an adept into a living body, whether of an adult child or newborn babe. Tulpa is a magical process, and the tulku is the result. Um, so in that sense, I thought judge could have been uh, uh, using this tulpa process, but um, I don't know how much a difference differs from what judge, as you said correctly, what actually happened with judge was that he was um, an adept committed on the path and he was helped by, a, 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 well, he, he describes him as being an elderly Brahmin yogi, but obviously a, a higher adept to, to enter into the young Irish boy who was um, uh, expiring, and leaving his body. <clears throat> but um, it, it is a mysterious process. I think I have seen yeah. some, some philosophical writers using that word tolku in this case, and I think the definition of it given by Vikash was perhaps the way it's specifically used in Tibetan Buddhism, or perhaps in the quote from HPB that we I just referred to, it may be that it's defined or used slightly differently by the masters, but we don't really know. I think the important thing is to understand the concept or the principle that's being referred to, whatever name it may have. We have one more question Thank you. from Sammy. I don't know whether we got enough time to answer it. It's uh, on dispassion. How does one cultivate dispassion? And can this only be achieved through life experience? Well, there was also a question from Laurie about duty, but... Yeah, but it's been answered by Will. In the chat box? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I suppose we could, if someone would like to very briefly offer an answer to Sunny's question. Mm -hmm. In fact, Patanjali does answer that, doesn't he? I don't have the book open, but... As I think Sonny is referring to that quote from Patanjali in the second talk. Yes. And doesn't Patanjali... Can you read it? Sorry? Can you read the question on Patanjali, please? I'll, I'll see if I can answer. Well, the question doesn't mention Patanjali, but it's in relation, I think, to the Patanjali quote. It's in the chat box 20 minutes ago. It says... How does one cultivate dispassion? Can this only be achieved through life experience? And I was saying, I think that a few lines later from that quote that was in the second talk, Patanjali explains how to cultivate dispassion. Yes, it's true. Uh, Patanjali uh, uh, describes in book one the whole process of preparing oneself to control the mind that is to uh, learn to um, stop the mind from wandering from one subject to another but to bring it back to the to the same point and also to control all the uh, 
distractions of the mind and it's the whole process of controlling the mind that's described and and of course there is the whole uh, the dispassion um, dealt there um, so at the end of that book book one you get into the uh, the state of consciousness where you you have controlled the mind with uh, with respect to the senses and the dispassion so uh, and that's very um, very minutely uh, described um, it's it's uh, it's not now the time to go into that detail uh, but it's it's there yeah thank you vijaya so again we recommend the reading of patanjali so that's all we have time for today. Thank you for tonight's readers, speakers, and those asking questions, those helping to answer, and also to those who just chose to listen quietly. That's also all appreciated that you're involved and joining and taking part.